Hello and uh, welcome to a new podcast from the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden. Uh, my name is Hussein Askari. Uh, today is March 16th, uh, 2021. And uh, today we will uh, take you on the wide oceans and open oceans and uh, to discuss the maritime Silk Road of the 21st century, which is one leg of the Belt and Road Initiative. And to go on this uh, massive adventure, uh, we need a real a capable captain who can take us there and bring us back home safely. And uh, I would like to introduce you to Professor Richard Griffiths from the International Institute for Asian Studies in Leiden University, and he is the director of the New Silk Roads Project. Welcome, Professor Griffiths. Hello, Hussein, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this set of uh, webinars that you've been hosting recently. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very happy you could join us today. Uh, and by the way, with the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden and your new Silk Roads project, we are we have an agreement because you have had a fantastic series of podcasts on the new Silk Roads, uh, which now we share. We share your podcast on our website. If you go to our website uh, for the, the bricksweden.org and to media and videos, you will find below our list of videos uh, the list of videos from Professor Griffith's uh, new Silk Roads projects, a fascinating series of very, very informative, in-depth uh, discussions about many aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative and the Silk Roads, even historical facts. So we are very happy to have that kind of cooperation. So just basically, I would like you to take us on this tour on the oceans and tell us a bit about what the maritime Silk Road uh, of the 21st century is. Certainly. I'd like to share my screen, so I will be doing that now. Um, screen share and now move up. Now, Great. that's a good question exactly what is the Maritime Silk Road? Because there's quite a lot of, I think, discussion about it and um, in fact, miscomprehension about what it is. And it's partly the fault of these two uh, maps that I'm showing you. These were both maps published by the Chinese news agency, they're called unofficial maps, in the spring of 2015. And that was about 18 months after the Silk Roads had been launched. And in that intervening time, there'd been very little information about what was involved. And then suddenly these two maps appeared. The one on the left came first, and you can see basically an overland route being traced, which basically seemed to have followed the ancient Silk Road. And then on the sea, you can see the ships visiting a number of ports in China, going through past Indonesia. And I've messed this up by pressing the wrong button. Can we go back? Yeah. Uh, just first, uh, to uh, inform our, in, okay, 2013, okay. in 2013, President Xi Jinping of China first announced in September of that year in Kazakhstan the establishment or the launching of the the economic belt of the Silk Road, which is a land-based. But then in October 2013, he visited Indonesia and uh, where he there then spoke about this maritime new Silk Road. And so that was 2013, but he was saying in 2015, these illustrations have come. Please go ahead. It was only in 2015 that we really began to get some information about what everything was involved. And here you see these two unofficial maps that uh, coincided with this sudden opening of information and news. In the left-hand side, that was the first one that seems to trace the overland Silk Road of old of the 14th century or so. And there underneath you have a, uh, a ship or a blue line that visits first a number of Chinese ports, goes through Indonesia, up to the north of uh, the Indian continent, swings across Africa and swings through into uh, Europe. A little later, you've got the map on the right, and you see a dramatic change on the overland route, because in between, President Xi Jinping had been to Moscow and visited uh, President Putin and realized that they'd left Moscow out, so they have this very elegant sweep 
to pick up Moscow. And the twirly lines of the Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road, they become a little more complex. And we're talking now about this Maritime Silk Road. What do these lines on that map seem to represent? And the thing is, they seem to persist through the iconography of the Silk Road. So I'm going to show you several other maps that I've just taken off the internet, but they're fairly typical of yeah. what you can see. All these, as you said, these are inofficial. The Chinese government have not released any of its own maps saying this is what we mean. Yes, it means that there's no, the Chinese have, government has actually divorced itself from these maps. So There's nothing to do with us. Yeah. So this is what's appeared now by the West. And if you look at the first one, so I've taken these as random, you can see that the overland routes now correspond more closely with the actual overland routes. But still, if you look at the Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road, you still have this line connecting different ports on more or less a squiggly route. On the right-hand side, you see the same thing again. A new attempt to draw the overland routes that represent now more growth corridors, but still this rather odd line of visit. Down beneath, the same thing, an overland route that coincides with a reality and this rather strange set of lines where you visit Kolkata, Colombo, Guadra, Djibouti on your way to Europe. And even on the right, which is one of my favorite ones of the overland route, which corresponds with the actual development corridors, you can still see this same pattern, almost as though it's imprinted on the sea that this is what the Maritime Silk Road is. And it is absolutely ridiculous. Firstly, because there is no single Chinese ship or any other ship which would visit that sequence of ports in that order. And secondly, because there is no real connection between the one port and the other and what the reality is of the Maritime Silk Road. This is the Maritime Silk Road. This I took this morning off the internet from uh, marinetraffic.com, which is one of my favorite sites for uh, playing around. Right. And this is real time. This is real time shipping. This is real time shipping. And the red are tankers, mostly oil tankers, but liquefied natural gas, chemical tankers, and the green are cargo vessels. And you can see from the uh, China this huge concentration of uh, vessels on the coast of China, which is also visiting, of course, Japan and Korea. And then on the other side in Europe, again, a huge cluster of uh, uh, cargo vessels and tankers there, also representing intra-European trade, intra-East Asian trade. Then you have a cluster of intra-trade around Thailand and uh, at the ASEAN countries, but basically you have the huge sweep across the southern coast of uh, the Eurasian continent up through the Suez Canal and into Europe. Now joining this Silk Road, joining this network of sea lanes, you have a stream of traffic coming from uh, say Brazil, for example, which is bringing iron ore through to uh, China and also upwards from Australia, also joining it with coal, and uh, minerals. That central piece of shipping is what I call the Maritime Silk Road. It doesn't belong to anyone. It's a stretch of sea routes, and it is very important in world trade because about 80 or 90 percent of world trade goes on the sea. Depends how you measure it, value or volume, whether you include intra-trade in Europe or exclude it. So that's why I say between 80 and 90 percent and of that, the intra-Asia Eurasian trade route counts for about 40% of it. 20% is on the North Atlantic route, 20% on the Pacific route, and the rest is various combinations of South-South trade. Yeah. So this is the Maritime Silk Road, okay. the central core um, in uh, international exchange. Wonderful. Yeah, but the uh, the uh, the, uh, the the Chinese uh, government have made a point when they launched the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and the Maritime Silk Road is that it's also contributing to developing and building 
ports and logistics centers in different parts of the, uh, the uh, Asia, Europe uh, 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 the trade routes. So it's not simply using that as a trade route, but also it's building and developing ports and logistic centers, whether it's in, um, in East Asia, in uh, Sri Lanka, we have the famous case of Hambantuta, but nobody talks about the massive development in the Colombo port. Uh, we have uh, in the East Coast of Africa, uh, we have also Ch Egypt has taken the, the initiative itself to build the second Suez Canal, but also build a huge logistics and uh, 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 free economic zones in the Suez Canal area. So, but there is not only trade, but there is also a development process going on to enhance that shipping uh, activity. Is now, now that you have answered the question, what is not the Maritime Silk Road and what is the Maritime Silk Road according to you? Now there's a, also another aspect of this because both in Chinese uh, uh, modern literature now and media, we hear the story of the, that there was a historical Maritime Silk Road uh, with the uh, with the fleet, which uh, the Admiral Zheng He was leading and so on. You yourself have actually written a several books. You can as well tell us about the books. You have written about the history of the Silk Road, but let please tell us a little bit about the, the ancient history of the Maritime Silk Road. Yeah. Well, um, let's start first with the, the Admiral Zhi Shi Ho which I believe is the correct pronunciation. And we'll look, have a look at his voyages and then I'll discuss uh, a little bit further. So um, I'm going to share my screen again. And now Admiral uh, Xiong Ho was uh, a eunuch uh, Admiral of the fleet and he was dispatched by the emperor on um, seven voyages in total in the beginning of the 15th century. And in his lecture, in his speech in Indonesia, uh, President Xi Jinping refers specifically to this because basically he juxtaposes the largest and most powerful fleet in world history, visits these neighboring countries and does not attack anyone. They come in peace and establish good and friendly relations with each other. Now, I have to confess that he doesn't go to war with anyone, so it's basically peaceful. Um, there's an elimination of a little piracy problem and a little regime change, but it depends who's writing about that, whether you interpret that as peaceful or not. But basically, these voyages are anchored into the current discourse on the Silk Road. It is a country, a continent, a sea dominated by the Asians, the Europeans haven't arrived yet, and China is arriving with this huge treasure fleet. And presidency, uh, sorry, Admiral Zheng Ho makes seven voyages. Now, they all follow the same pattern in the beginning. They go through um, what is now Indonesia, through the Malay Peninsula, and then the first four voyages end in the southern tip of, Cal of India and they go no further. And they return with uh, ambassadors to the court of the emperor, and the ambassadors come often from further afield. They've come from Africa and from Arabia, but the, they come to the Chinese and they go back, the ambassadors then stay, they offer tribute to the emperor, and the emperor, because he is the emperor, gives a bigger tribute back, and there's a bit of trade done on the side. Now, after those first four voyages on the next three, the fleet probably splits and they begin to become more adventurous. So I don't think the whole fleet does goes on the further voyages, but certainly um, Chinese ships do. And they visit first the Arabia. They certainly get as far as Jeddah because we have an eyewitness account of the seventh uh, voyage from that. And they may or may not have reached uh, Africa themselves. Certainly the Africans managed to reach them because there are Africans uh, at the court of uh, the emperor. So is this idea of peace, peaceful communication between peoples that it helps to brand the Maritime Silk Road with its uh, greater um, 
region of prosperity for all. Now, the probably even in ancient times, the Silk Road by sea was much more important in trade than the overland route. Camels, um, considering the camel train also has to carry the luggage for the camels, their feed, the feed for the people, the tents and everything else, a camel probably doesn't carry much more than 500 grams, half, 500 kilograms, sorry, half a ton at the most. And a camel train would be, what, 40, 48 camels. So you can see it's not a lot of tonnage, whereas even in those days, a simple uh, dhal could carry um, 100 tons or more. So what you can see early on is that there is a trade coming from China by sea and reaching, now we don't know how, it picks up, we think, with uh, Malay uh, sailors inside the Bay of Bengal, and that the Arab sailors probably dominate the route from the Arabian Sea onwards. So the first thing of the Chinese voyages, this is probably the first time that Chinese ships en masse have ventured outside this area of uh, East Asia. So that's how the, the overland routes have gone. And not only uh, goods travel that way, but people also begin to travel large distances by ship in this period. Yeah, I think that in the history of the Arab world, which I have a bit knowledge of, there was enormous also communication prior to Zheng He's uh, trips. Yeah. Arabs were doing trade with Malaysia, Indonesia, and Muslim uh, seafarers and travelers like Ibn Battuta and others, they have reported their trips even all the way to China and back. So this has been a historical, we have the uh, the trade winds, you know, because they yes. travel with the, the sail ships, travel with the, with the uh, monsoon seasons, once to the east and once to the west. And, so that's a very fascinating history. Yes, I, mean, I think so. so it's, it's, but it's anyway, so that's, great. that's interesting. But uh, so we go back now to the modern times. And since 2013, when this Maritime Silk Road was announced, how has it evolved? And what has been the impact on trade uh, in at, at least between yeah. Eastern Asia, East Asia and Europe? Yeah. Well, that's how I'd like to look at it. Is that trade between uh, East Asia and Europe? And again, I'd like to take a few um, oops, screen sharing again. And I am, yeah, let's see where I get to. Just some numbers. Um, right. So the first thing to look at is the total amount of cargo that moves uh, along this route between Asia and Europe. Now, some of it is Chinese, obviously, some of it is um, Japanese, Korean, and of course, European in the other direction. But the total cargo along that route grows from 9.6 billion tons to 11 billion tons uh, in the last um, yeah, six years since the uh, campaign was uh, launched, the initiative. And then this includes container shipping in that tonnage. But we have separate data for container ships, and that's quite interesting because container shipping grows from 160 million. Now, TEUs is 20 foot equivalent units. So that's a seven meter standard container. And a shipping container will be uh, double that size, 40 foot equivalent units. So this is how container capacity of a ship is measured. So basically, 160 million containers will go on that route, rising to 811 million containers. So that is 400% growth in five or six years. So to that area has completely transformed. Now, containers are interesting. They account for probably about a quarter of the volume of traffic on the Maritime Silk Road, but about three quarters of the value because they're mostly semi-manufactured goods, components and finished goods. So the value added is very high. So I want to look a little bit more on containers because it, it shows what's happening in the Maritime Silk Road. The average container ship, looking at the fleet of container ships 2013 was 3,000, 3,500 standard containers. And the largest ship at the time 
was 18,000, a single ship carrying 18,000 um, standard containers. If we move to the most recent numbers now, the largest ship now carries almost 24,000 containers in one ship. And the average size of container ship has risen um, accordingly. So the average size of container ships has risen by 25% and the uh, maximum size has risen even more. So there's been this large growth of shipping uh, and size of ships, and that has huge implications uh, for development. Um, it means, for example, that at every time the ships are larger, which means the cranes to handle them have to be larger, which means that the docks have to be reinforced to take the, uh, the leverage of the cranes. It means that there's more boxes being deposited on each visit. They have to be cleared from the dock side and have to be cleared from the port. And so the whole logistics of container shipping has changed. So only the very most modern ports can take these large ships and they have to be able to handle them because this isn't a lump of coal. Each of those containers is individual. It's ordered by one firm going to one destination. It's not like a, a ton of coal where the first ton is the same as the last ton. So you have to know exactly what you're doing. So the ports are becoming more mechanized, more automated, more computerized. But that's not all. Not only do you have to expand the port facilities and modernize them, but the ships that used to visit these larger ports now are passed downwards, down the scale, because once these large ships have arrived, then their produce is often redistributed also by sea, by ship. And so you get a cascade effect of these container ships going down until the small little ship that used to have its own crane attached has now more or less disappeared. Yeah, so, so that's the concept of transshipment ports, like the Jabal Ali port in Dubai. It yeah. retrieves the large ships from Asia and Europe, and then it distributes it in smaller ships to the rest of the Gulf countries. Yeah, like, uh, like Singapore, which is a, a transit port par excellence, like Colombo, which is also a major transit port in uh, the uh, Indian Ocean, and like the ships in uh, Hamburg, Rotterdam and uh, Piraeus, if you like, in Greece, they ha all have this same function. Yeah. Okay, that's fascinating development there. Uh, there is a, a, the question of the, we have developing and we had in one of our podcasts, uh, a guest who is an expert on rail freight between Asia and Europe, which is, is also growing. Uh, a lot. It's the Eurasian rail freight uh, system, which starts in some provinces in China and then through Western China to Kazakhstan, Russia, and then to the rest of Europe. And now we have even lines that go from Kazakhstan across the Caspian Sea to Turkey and so on and so forth. So what is the difference, first of all, in the time uh, of shipping by the sea and by land? And also what is the difference in cost uh, between the two systems. Yep. But again, I'll uh, share my screen because um, we have the numbers up there. And I will just, um, oops, go through, see if I am sharing. Okay. You um, a full screen if you wish. Yeah. Slideshow. Okay, sorry, I am um, I'm screen sharing now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now the overland, the China Europe Express, um, costs about five thousand uh, dollars for a small container, the twenty foot container, or eight thousand dollars for a shipping container to ship that from China to Europe. Journey time will be about ten to twelve days. Now. The shipping cost used to be much less. To sell, send a shipping container, that is the one that's measured up here at $8,000, to send that from China to Europe by sea would cost between $1,500 and $2,000, but it would take three weeks or more at sea. 
Now, this has been the, the typical picture that is presented. So you pay more by uh, the overland traffic, but it goes faster. And, and this is very important, it goes on time. So you can plan it much more easily. And if you have the time to wait, doesn't matter because they're teddy bears or they are Christmas lights or whatever, then you can afford to send them by sea and it doesn't matter. It also matters a lot because if you send high value goods, the number of days it's traveling, you're still spending money. You have to borrow the money to have those goods. It's not earning you anything. And so the higher the value that's inside that container, the more it's costing you to hang around having it doing nothing, in other words. So this was the picture, but it's very interesting because the corona crisis and its effect have caused absolute chaos. So this month, these are the actual figures. If you want to send a container from Shanghai to Rotterdam, it's going to cost you almost $8,000 to send a shipping container, which is unheard of high. I mean, we're, we're talking about a time when, inter, when GDP has dropped, international trade has dropped, and yet we have record high freight rates. That's by ships, you mean? Yeah, by ships. And on the other direction, yeah, it's not much higher. It's 1,400 for a shipping container. So there is enormous pressure on uh, capacity. And what's happened is COVID uh, rules in, in managing the ports, large distribution bottlenecks, containers piled up in the wrong places, a complete disturbance of that maritime Silk Road logistics. So how long this situation will last? It's also because the shipping companies have combined to lower the number of ships that are shipping. I mean, the container shipping is almost cartelized. There's three big groups that dominate that Eurasian trade. And they, I think, have more or less combined in order to manage the market. But one of the results is, although the costs have gone up, the frequency has gone up, as well, has gone down, and the delays have gone up. And this isn't just here. There was a, a mad situation uh, last year when the price of uh, oil tankers, hiring an oil tanker, went through the roof um, and people were just buying and wanting any capacity to store oil because oil was so cheap, they couldn't offload it. But it'd be the better ships. just to hire a ship and use a ship as a sort of huge oil well until the price of yeah. oil went back up. Okay. So there are huge movements here. Right. But let's have a look at the longer term trend. Um, the land bridge, I think, takes about 5% of the container traffic between Asia and Europe. Um, again, volume uh, price-wise, it could be higher if you take it in uh, value terms, but it's a, that's about the thing. Last data we had, 2019, 8,200 trains went through. Um, after that, this figure will be affected by the COVID pandemic. That's in both directions. Um, so they don't, it's, they don't come back to the train. It won't make a return journey to the separate trains anyway. Yeah. The maximum capacity of a train is 82 standard containers or 41 shipping containers. And that's because the length of a train traveling through Europe is fixed at 750 meters. So that's what it can take. So let's have a look at how many containers might uh, be carried. Let's assume that two thirds of those trains are from China to Europe, one third in the other direction, and they're fully loaded. Now, the, both of these are assumptions and especially the fully loaded one, but that would mean 440,000 containers came by train from China to Europe last year. It sounds a lot until you look at what is happening by, with container trades. Rotterdam handles 14 and a half million containers a year. All right, some of these will come from other European countries. Some will come from America. Antwerp takes 11 million. Hamburg, 8.7 million. Bremen, 5.4 million. Just add those together, halve them or reduce them by a quarter. It doesn't matter. Um, there is much more, much more arriving by ship than is arriving by the land bridge. 
Piraeus, the new port, 4.9 million. It's the next Spanish port and after that, 4.7 million. The world's 99th container port, which is Kingston, Jamaica, 1.6 million standard containers goes through that port alone. And this is the entire Europe, China trade going in one direction. Yeah. Now you say, okay, what is the potential of it? Well, that's quite interesting. There's two issues. Firstly, those prices in China are held down by subsidies. There is enormous competition, especially between uh, the three Central Asian hubs, Central Chinese hub, Chengdu, Chongqing, and Xi'an are fighting for this uh, traffic and the paying subsidies. Now, the Chinese government wants these subsidies abolished. And it also has already said, you can only subsidize a train if all of those containers are full and if the train is fully loaded. Now, we don't know how much that is actually being observed, but I think many of these routes will stay on paper as an occasional train with nothing like a regular traffic. Over half of the Europe uh, China Express come from those three cities. Mm. Now, the second problem is one of capacity. At the moment, those trains roll through uh, Kazakhstan and Russia on the wider Russian gauge so that the containers get transshipped on the border when it has to go onto a different gauge. This transshipment was seen as a terrible problem, but as long as the train is ready to take the new containers, it'll take you about an hour or more, hour and a half to clear a complete train. To clear the documents for the shipping and everything else probably takes a couple of hours. So on a crossing, you should be able to deal with 12 trains a day. And if you have a crossing next door, there's 24 trains a day, but that's all. So there is an enormous capacity problem at the borders. And you see this uh, last year, it was piling up on the border with Poland. Now there are ways out. And one of the ways is, this is what the Latvians and Estonians say, yeah, we have Russian gauge, so we haven't got to transfer to get the trains going through, through there and ship on to those ports, ship them through to Russia and get them going to the Russian ports. Um, Austria, I believe, has said, let's have a standard gauge, a Russian gauge railway into Austria and then dump them there so that we don't have this two phase of um, the bottleneck of transferring the containers. But at the moment, that remains a bottleneck on the borders of Europe. Now, Europeans, your EU would love to solve it, and it can offer subsidies, but it cannot make a member state spend the subsidies to improve its border crossing. They are free to apply for an improvement. If they don't do that or do it slowly, there's not much Europe can do. So there are bottlenecks arriving at both ends of the corridor, and that, I think, limits uh, a large expansion of that trade right so uh so the land-based freight routes can never be a competitor to the shipping routes and they will might probably be reserved for lightweight high value commodities that need to reach the market quickly yeah high value commodities just in time production um, cooling and heating controls, because you can do that. You, so you can't control the heating for three weeks at sea, but you can start having chilled vegetables and the like going across, uh, or flowers or milk or meat products um, going on these routes. So there is an expansion there, but there is a quite clear capacity problem. So it's a niche market, an important niche market. Right. I don't think it'll ever become a mass market. Right. Yeah, that this brings us to the next question on the importance of land-based transport is that this is not simply a trade issue, but because these, I think the President Xi Jinping called it the, belt, the economic belt of the new Silk Road. He didn't call it the trade belt of the Silk Road, which implies that these could become development corridors, the railways and roads uh, which we have seen in China's own development, without these infrastructure, you couldn't develop the inner parts of China. So that these land-based routes could become development corridors rather than just simply trade corridors because you have landlocked areas, regions and countries who have certain resources, but they cannot 
utilize them for the lack of transport, electricity, or water, or whatever, and that these corridors will bring these necess necessary production means and also help them export their products to other regions. So in that sense, this could become like a development corridor, but also the other question is, can the Maritime Silk Road become such a development corridor? Okay, thank you. I think it's a good question. Uh, and I'd like again to uh, move to screen share. Um, oh, we're doing it now. So railways can have that effect. The, the train will go along and it detours on its long journey. It will stop, um, unload its goods, and those goods will be used for local development. All local goods can be loaded onto the train and continue on their journey. And this is even the case with roads. So as long as we see that network of railways and roads as open to anyone, just like the ancient Silk Road used to be, it wasn't all long distance traffic. Even local people use the same roads just as they do today. So we don't say, oh, this is a Chinese Kazakh road, nobody else can use it. So there's nothing to stop the trains going into other countries, uh, into um, Kazakhstan. Um, for example, in fact, the first long distance travel, Hewlett Packard sending components to Chongqing to be developed and assembled and then getting them back. Korea sent car parts to Almaty in order to get them developed. But the China Europe Express train specifically cannot do that, does not have that function because it only stops at either end. The train goes through as one, what's called a block train with one customs clearance. Nothing goes on it and nothing comes off it. And so at the ends, yes, where the, just as on the other routes, where the traffic comes in, cargos come in, they can be used for development. The same, of course, is true for the Maritime Silk Road. Where the goods are landed or where they're assembled, you always had economic development in the past because the goods were cheaper at the port than anywhere else inland in their destination. So factories would end up working the, the chemicals into paints and chemicals, the minerals, uh, smelting them. Um, and you've got the same now, Rotterdam, chemical factories, oil refineries are built around the products that come in. And in the same way, the logistics that are required for operating the port, again, generates a, a hub of economic activity. Now, China has been very specific in its economic model to have this port city idea, that you build a port and next to the port, you build an economic zone. And this is very much the Shenzhen model, the classic model where they develop the small port into the major harbor it is today with an economic zone with special concessions attached. And it tries to replicate this model and there's nothing to stop Europeans doing it, but this is a very China thing. So for example, in Hambam Tota, they say, all right, there'll be a, a development zone. And in Gwadra, there'll be a development zone. The yeah, problem Gwadra, is, in Pakistan, you mean? In Pakistan. Yeah. The problem is in neither of them, have they really got a functioning port yet? Hambam Tota takes uh, a couple of car carriers a week and then ships them on. Um, there's no sign of any other port development and Guadra barely functions as a port at the moment. And that's the problem. So there are good examples in um, Malaysia. There's a very good example where the local port is linked to a Chinese port and they are deliberately linked together. Um, developments in Egypt where large uh, textile factories are close to the ports. But the thing is the Chinese model is difficult to transplant. Um, because in China, you have a very close association between the state banks, the larger state firms, the party, and there's a close alliance of interests. And that's not shared elsewhere. So when they tried this special economic zones, which they've been trying in Africa for a long time, there are very few of the economic zones in Africa actually worked. And what tends to happen is that the nice luxury accommodation gets built, the hotel gets built, the casino might get built, but then the rest gets a little bit forgotten. And this is going to be the problem with it, getting this model to work. 
Hambon Tota is on the edge of a nature reserve. It hasn't got a natural population. Why are you going to build uh, you know, some sort of development there uh, rather than closer to Colombo, where you're also plowing in a lot of money, where you do have this ancillary agglomeration? Mm -hmm. um, and the same happens elsewhere. Piraeus in Greece. Yeah, you can't do it there because you've got all the ancient monuments of Athens right next door. There's not enough room to do it there. So, it, of course, the model will work and can work, um, but will it work is a different question. And it's not specifically Chinese. Uh, Japan, the economic corridors from Bangkok moving up to Ayotthaya, now moving along the coast, those in a way are Japanese economic zones where Japan built its assembly plants. So, yeah, it's eminently possible. And in the case of shipping, eminently sensible, because the goods are cheaper at that point than after moving them further in. Right. Yeah, great. I think it, what is needed is that this should be a coordinated policy. You cannot expect China or Japan come to your country and do all these miracles for you. It has to be part of your national development plan. I think one country which is pursuing that very systematically is Ethiopia, although it's not a it's a landlocked country, but their development is coordinated between building the transport corridors. Uh, the power generation, the hydro, hydropower, and building these industrial zones. Uh, of course, China is uh, very much interested in both the local market, but also is using it as a production center. But this is, has been like a, consect, uh, a sequence of national development plans, five-year plans for Ethiopia. So it's a consistent policy. It's not just waiting there for the Chinese to come and do something. So that's, I think, what is... It's free for any country. I mean, uh, I like... Um, we have project running within the new Silk Roads on the, uh, the Pakistan corridor. And there, the Chinese have been very active in upfront provision of electricity and in infrastructure development. Right. Um, a classic example in Europe, though, uh, is Ireland, which attracted a lot of Japanese investment into parks and helped develop it that way. So it's an option that's open to anyone, but it has to be supported by the local government and wanted. You can't just go and impose yourself on uh, on a country. You can't impose this pattern mm -hmm. on a country. So I can see a pattern happen happening where you get these development zones with a mixture of local and Chinese investment, but you do need all the ancillary provision as well. And it's not always in the best place. Wadra is in a very dangerous politically sensitive area and Hambantota is very isolated from any transport connections or any population, local population even, um, to make it work. Mm -hmm. And yet these are the ones where people focus on this is the big danger of China. And these, you know, if it's such a danger, China spent over a decade not doing very much in those port areas. Um, and I think because, yeah, the, the, the conditions are not right for such development. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I think we come to our final question then, because this is also, uh, you have that passion for studying the history and the cultural transformations of through the, you know, the ancient Silk Road. I myself have also that fascination. I wrote a paper several years ago on how the transfer of the paper making technology from China to the Islamic world in the eighth and ninth century that was a revolution in science and technology because scientific, technological, medical things were replicated and printed and spread all over the world. It's like internet today. So uh, it was not silk or spices, which was the most important thing. It was paper, <laughs> which made the big difference at the time as the highest value uh, to that the, the, the trade route. So, you may say something about also, you wrote some books on the Silk Road. Uh, you may let us know about that, but what is the role of the ancient and the current Silk Road as a conveyor belt for cultural scientific exchange among nations? Well, the ancient Silk Roads, um, I mean, silk was a misnomer because as you point out, there's much more than silk being carried and silk is obviously not always the most important product and certainly not the most consistent one carried on these routes. 
One of the things that did happen wherever trading towns occurred is you tend to get mixtures of merchants of different nationalities. In those days, nationalities, religions, customs, cultures were very intermixed so that you got a homogeneous group but linked together in a heterogeneous community. Segregated often with separate zones um, and tolerated and respected for most of the period because otherwise trade couldn't go on. So we mustn't idealize this. There were flare ups of religious and ethnic violence even in those days. Um, so, well, I'm not going through the example, no need on the negative for long periods that you had a stable relationship because that's what you need for traders to work, for the trade to work. So you have these movements of thought and religion, um, the Buddhist caves along the Silk Road, the uh, Islamic uh, communities along the Silk Road are basically grown up under the ancient Silk Road uh, movement. Not always by, by land. Um, a lot of the uh, Buddhist influence went up from Sri Lanka, uh, Ceylon, then uh, through by ship. Uh, I was impressed reading some of these monk stories that you almost got a bus service with you know, 300 monks traveling up the coast of India to get back to China. I thought, wow, you know, this is something that you don't think about uh, really. So you get this, uh, these cultures and you've got the, the hangovers of them even now where you see it in style. I was impressed when I went to Urumqi first uh, in the west of uh, China and the meat that you smell there is, is lamb on barbecues and the bread is, is Turkic bread even today. So you've got this huge transfer of uh, food, culinary ideas, medicine, scientific ideas going the other way from Europe, from Asia to Europe, mathematic principles uh, learned then from uh, the Middle East. Uh, the, so the ancient Silk Road was a bearer of different cultures. Um, and basically the lesson of Xi, Xi Jinping is making it, yeah, it only works when it's peaceful. We know that, we know that with wars in, in Europe, for God's sake, there's one continent that must know the effect of wars disrupting trade, disrupting lives, it must be Western Europe now. And yet this message still is going through. You need peace to trade, you need trust. They build up, there's a circuit of moving. And that's what China tries to articulate um, and which not everybody accepts. It's how we look at the domestic regime. Now, the thing is, this is what the China say, we're not looking at the domestic regime, we're looking at this interaction to know each other better, to know the people better. Um, I too tend to believe that's why I set up the Silk Roads and I mention it in plural because it's not just China. China has a, China has a policy, an initiative, but I, other people trade, and they trade with neighbors and the, this neighborliness of trade dampens often tensions. And when tensions increase, the trade goes down. We can see this everywhere. So for me, in a way, it's a truth. I'm not naive, but you know, I'm not going to be completely stupid in this, but I can see the advantage of this. And in many ways, old tensions have dissipated. You talk about Germans now in, in Europe. Nobody sees Germans as a militaristic uh, nation anymore. Uh, Japan, you know, whoever thinks now of the, the warlike Japanese, uh, Japanese fascism, we don't forget these colonial ventures, but we put them into context. We've outgrown them in many ways. And I think this is the message that China is trying to get across. And it's not, I think we've got to not see it as a Chinese message. Other people, Europe propagates it too, except from a different approach with a values approach, we think if everybody shares our values, you're dead right. If everybody respects everybody else in the rule of law, you won't have a war. Yeah, we will have the, uh, the, the, the website uh, address of your, your new Silk Road project below the video, so people can click on it and visit your, okay, that's good. your project. And, uh, but thank you very much, Professor Griffith. Our treasury ship is rich with one more chest of knowledge and information uh, and now we are back safe from the high waves of the oceans back in our port. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time of talking to us and to our audience.
Uh, thank you very much and good luck with the, the rest of the interviews, which we'll be hosting uh, on our website too. And I hope we'll be expanding our collaboration further in the future. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much, Professor Griffiths. Uh, and thank you, our audience, for uh, following this uh, wonderful uh, adventure. And uh, please uh, visit our website at bricssweden.org and also on our YouTube channel and subscribe to our so you can receive notifications about our series we will have every week new podcasts of different aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, from different geographical but also conceptual perspectives and uh, thank you for uh, being with us uh, this week see you soon bye-bye